Uh, I hope if you're looking to ensure high quality data, you're in the right place. Our next talk is on returns to Data's Inferno. Are the seven layers of data testing hell still relevant? We're joined here today by Daniel van der Einde, data engineer at Xavier. Let's give him a, round, a warm round of applause as a welcome. All right, hello everybody. Uh, it's 2.30ish on a Friday afternoon, so I'm really happy to see so many people still ready and willing to take this journey back into hell with me. Uh, we're going to be taking a look at Data's Inferno um, and seeing if those seven layers of data testing hell are still relevant. So quick show of hands, who here knows what data in Data's Inferno is? Has seen the talk, heard the talk? Okay, a few hands. Okay. Great. Uh, then you'll also get a bit of history lesson of uh, what we did back in 2017, 2018. Uh, firstly, a little bit about me. So I'm a data engineer at Xebia Data. Um, I was thinking about what to put on this slide, so I figured, well, I could just tell you what I like. So I like automation, and I like robust data pipelines, and I like memes. Uh, it might show on my slides. Sorry. Um, what I don't like, bad data, manual processes, and data managed in Excel sheets. Um, I've been... Uh, Confronted with that too often, unfortunately. Um, so for the uninitiated, of which we have quite a few here, so Data's Inferno was a meetup and a conference talk back in 2017 and 18 um, that I, I gave uh, with a, a colleague at the time, John Muller. Shout out to John. He's not here today. Um, but he was my, my partner in crime on this. Uh, we had a blog post to accompany, it, uh, to accompany it and a GitHub repo as well with some examples of how we actually did this uh, on a dummy uh, data set. Um, essentially, it was an, uh, an explanation of how we approach dealing with really bad quality data. Um, so we're going to take a look at that today and see uh, what still remains of that six years on. Um, so as I said, it, it is a story about data quality. So to give you a bit of context, what we were dealing with at the time was I was working at ING, uh, a major bank in the Netherlands, but also outside of uh, the Netherlands, and we were trying to build a really awesome data-driven application, and also data science models, artificial intelligence models, on top of that you know, large data set. Um, the data set, the biggest one was the transactions, so payment transactions, you know, when you go into the supermarket and pay for something. Uh, and we were doing some interesting analytics on that, um, but garbage in, garbage out, right? Uh, cliche almost. Uh, it was hard to work with the data. We had some real quality issues in getting, making sure that the data made sense. Um, anecdotally, at some point, we decided that the top 100 or 1,000 companies in the world in terms of profits were all Hungarian. Why were they all Hungarian? Well, somebody did a bad currency conversion somewhere along the way and it got hidden and stuff happened. Um, so it's a journey back in time. And for me, this really was, I was sitting like this basically at my desk. I'm like, oh my God, I wrote this code. I did this. Um, so bear with me in that pain. Before we dive into the layers, First stop is the environment, because to understand where these layers came from at the time, you need to understand what kind of environment we were running in. So it was all on-prem. Um, you can see the tooling badges here. So we had Spark, Postgres, uh, Python, Druid, Scala. So quite a diverse set. And in the middle, we had Airflow, which was orchestrating the whole thing. Uh, and we had Hadoop. So I think of this stack, pretty much all of them are still around, though I would say Hadoop is fading into the background. Uh, not too many people are picking it up in you anymore uh, right now. Uh, I should also note that we had one Hadoop cluster. We had one Hadoop cluster, 10 nodes, one Airflow orchestrator on a VM, and we were processing 7 billion transactions multiple times a week. So it was a, a challenge. Um, so Data's Inferno. So Data's Inferno really was our way of dealing with this in a constrained environment fixing the data quality. And we sort of made this diagram uh, with all the layers. You can see them. I'm not going to read them out. But we're going to go past each layer and check out, are these still relevant? What would you do today if you had to apply this logic, this idea? Um, they're ordered not necessarily in terms of, you know, you should start at the first one and then the second and the third, more in terms of complexity. So the first one is the easiest one to implement. The last one is a lot more complicated. So the first one, the DAG integrity tests. Um, so everybody here familiar at least with the ideas of Airflow or have written Airflow DAGs, I hope. So I see a couple of hands. That's good. So everybody's done this, right? You have a couple of operators, uh, operator one, operator two, operator three. 
And you think, great, I'm going to push this to production. I'm ready. I have my bash scripts. Bash is ready for production, of course. And uh, boom, cycle detected in DAG. You're like, what? Why is this broken? Why is this not working? Why This is annoying. I've deployed to production or I've deployed to an environment and it just blows up in my face like this. And why? Well, we're lazy developers, so we copy paste. And the trick here was that we had spent the time renaming the variable but forgotten the parameter. It's a classic. I think probably everybody that has done Airflow has done something like this in the past. Um, so we introduced this idea of the DAG integrity test, which was really simple. It was sitting in your continuous integration pipeline. And essentially what it would do is, okay, you think you've written a DAG, that's valid. Let me just quickly check the semantics. Let me just quickly validate that that DAG is actually a DAG. So I'll check, you know, does your object make sense? Is it missing any required parameters? Uh, and I'll check for cycles. So this is a small pseudocode example up here, obviously. As you can see from uh, the way it looks, the full code is available in the repo link at the bottom. You'll also be happy to know I spent some time updating that repo for 2023. So all of the examples I'm going to show during the talk now with the 2023 parallel are in the repo as well. So you can take pictures, of course, but the code is there too. Um, so for each layer, I essentially thought, well, can we just ask, is this still relevant in 2023? Is this something you would still reasonably want to do? So for this, yes, I would still do this. It's simple, it's easy, it's lightweight and it can just save you some time. You could even integrate it into a pre-commit hook, perhaps, to run it locally before you commit in. I think the ideas are still uh, valid. There was a slight tweak in the integrity test because the Airflow API changed slightly, but the core is still there. The second one that we, in, uh, the second layer was more of a conceptual one. Um, and the idea that we had was to split data ingestion from data deployments. So again, the context was we were building an app and we were having Airflow deploy the data that the app needed into the back end uh, every, I think twice a week was the schedule. Um, and initially we just had all the data sources and all the processing and transformation in one big DAG. Uh, and that just was annoying. Uh, so at some point we said, look, we're gonna split out the ingestion from the deployment. Um, it wasn't so much a technical thing, it was much more conceptual. Um, what it allowed us to do was actually say, okay, we have separate data ingestion. That means if a source ingestion fails on one day, that's fine. The deployment into the app is decoupled. It will still run, it will have old data, but that's okay, nothing will break, and it won't block the deployment with the other uh, uh, data sources. The other thing that it, uh, it sort of almost implicitly forced us to do was to find an interface. So we were dealing with payment transactions but spread out over all sorts of sources. And all these sources were different systems, had different histories, different formats, different types, but they were representing the same business entity. So by doing this, we said, okay, but we have an interface. This is what our transactions interface looks like. You ha always have to map into that. And also, by doing that, unlock those data sources for other users, right? We were building it for our app, but other app or other developers were also interested in having this data in this interface uh, shape. So it might seem obvious now that this is the way to go. At the time, it wasn't super obvious, at least not to us. So still relevant, still thumbs up, very yes, 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 very relevant. So, so far, two out of seven, so we're, we're going, we're doing well. Layer three is data tests. Um, so the example I gave you earlier of the Hungarian company suddenly being the most wealthy on the planet was the sort of bug that we were regularly encounter, encountering. And it was hard because you would encounter it at the final step of the DAG, of, of your process, and then you'd need to sort of breadcrumb trace your way back in the DAG to figure out where, where, wh how did this happen? Okay, this table looks okay, now this one, and this one, and this one. It was really painful, and it just cost a lot of time. So that and several other of these incidents basically say, uh, led us to think, okay, regardless of how simple and trivial a task in Airflow is, every task is going to have a test task right afterwards. So you can see, I hope everybody can see in the back as well, our first task over there is union transactions, which was literally a union. It doesn't get much more simple than that in SQL, I would say. We would still test, like, did the numbers sort of add up? Are the, for instance, is the union table, is it bigger than all of the source tables? It's simple, but it saved us a lot of time. So in terms of implementation, back in 2017, this would look more or less like this. We had this beautiful join, uh, double uh, left join, 
And you can see it's SQL, but it's wrapped in Spark SQL, and then we would save it into Parquet files, essentially. Not super complex. I won't go over the details of the query, but this is how we did this. That was the union of the, the enrich transactions uh, task. And then our test task would look something like this. It would be an assertion based on a Spark SQL query. Again, still SQL assert that, in this case, after enriched transactions, we said all of the country fields should be filled. If they aren't filled, then something has gone wrong in the enrichment, and we need to abort immediately, because that will cause problems further down the line. Um, so looking at this, some of you might already have a feeling where I'm going. Uh, in 2023, there's this tool called dbt uh, that some of you might have heard of, um, and it really would have made our lives so much easier if we would have had this. Um, you can see the query is the same, so all the hard work going into getting the query right, yeah, okay, we still have to put that effort in, but no more Spark SQL, no more Spark session configuration. dbt has abstracted away all of that for us. We can just focus on the logic that we need to implement and structure our data in the way we need. Um, the test actually pretty much the same. So the query is a slight, just slightly different, but it's pretty much the same idea. You're still checking, are the country fields filled? If they're not, that's a problem. Alert, abort, crash, whatever, fail. Um, I did also check while I was revamping this, uh, this setup, like, could we have known about dbt back in 2017? So I looked it up, and it was around, but it was very sort of alpha, not quite ready yet. So that's sort of allayed my fears that we uh, missed something uh, at the time. Um, so data tests, 2023, still relevant. Uh, or thumbs up? Yes, thumbs up are good. Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, I think you know, the form, you know, do you need to do them after every union? I would still say it's worth the extra minute or two that they just take to run, but it saves you so much pain if something goes wrong. Our fourth layer was alerting. Um, I was looking at this one, and I was just thinking, this is so obvious. Like, if something fails, you just want to be alerted. Um, but the way we did it was actually, what it, well, I should rephrase that. What was interesting about alerting is that we did it in a very sort of direct manner. So we integrated with Slack. We had our bot, Chuck Norris, and Chuck Norris would just, every time a task would fail, it would just post. And the message was really simple. It says, this DAG is broken. This was the task. This was the, uh, the timestamp, the execution date, so you knew which one was. Do something. I can't do anything else. Of course, we also couldn't post straight into Slack because the error message might contain private details that we didn't want to share with Slack. Um, what was interesting about this wasn't necessarily only the technical mechanism, but also what it did with the team. So you can see there's a small icon there, and Daniel is up there. That was me. So telling two of the other guys, like, guys, I think you broke something. Please take a look. But then at the bottom, you also see in Slack, you see somebody replying to a message. So it brought this dynamic where it suddenly was much more transparent what people were working on. And if you were curious, you could also just look at the logs and say, oh, you're struggling with this and this. I know that that's Spark executor memory or something down those lines. So it, it helped in that way, too. Um, so back in 2017, this was uh, home built. Uh, we, we did uh, some uh, beautiful curl. I've abstracted away some of the logic here, but we had to get through the corporate proxy and do all sorts of token exchanges. And it, it wasn't that pretty, uh, but we did get it to work. And in the end, we could just say, okay, on fill your callback, Slack alert, send the message, your Chuck Norris, this is the channel, go. I'm happy to say that in 2023, there's an airflow provider for that. Uh, the interface is actually pretty much the same. They must have secretly stolen from us when I uh, wasn't looking. Um, but it, it just works. Uh, this is something I would just recommend. You know, if you have Slack, if you have Teams or some other chat app that you use it in your uh, in your day to day, use that. Um, but just bring it in your face. We had emails first. Uh, maybe I'm the only developer that does this, but emails like that, I just at some point just either actively move to trash automatically with Outlook or mentally move to trash, uh, at least. Um, so. Still relevant, yeah, and, and at this point, I don't know if I still need any memes or thumbs up. Uh, yes, still relevant, still do it. Layer five, um, so it's called Git enforcing. The term that we colloquially used uh, in the team was actually nuclear Git, and there was a reason for nuclear Git. So it harks back to the context that we were working in. We had one Airflow instance that everything had to run through. So what would sometimes happen is, 
somebody in the team would need to work on a feature, and they thought they had everything right, and then, but then they said, yeah, but I really need to run this through. I need to check if the code will actually execute, if it gives me the results I wanted, but I, I need to fiddle with it a bit. Um, so let me just quickly take a look. They would check out the code, and you know, it would fail, obviously. That's what would happen. They would fill it with more, fill it with it more, and then at the end of the day, they would go and drink beer, and they would leave the broken code sitting there. And then at sort of 2 a.m., the production pipeline would kick off, and then boom, production pipeline broke. So nuclear Git was a thing that ran at midnight, and it would just hard reset the entire Git environment backing Airflow to whatever was on the main branch at the time. Um, that was painful, and we had a few occasions where people actually lost work, but it did ensure that production was stayed working. That was our main focus. But also, it bred in this idea that your code must be in Git. If these people would have checked their code into Git, they wouldn't have lost their, their code. So that's sort of where the idea of Git enforcing came from, why we were doing this. Still relevant in 2023, that's the question that you think. I, for me, this one is a no. Uh, this really was a quirk of the environment that we were working in. It was a way to somehow get control. Uh, if you really want to look for sort of a glimmer of something that you still have uh, back from 2018, it's that you need to be in control of what's running in each environment, and it should be in version control. I wouldn't take this approach, though. So layer six is the idea of mock pipeline tests. Um, so in, in a sense, Data's Inferno is like this Swiss cheese model, right? You know that your, each slice of cheese is going to have holes in it, but by adding and stacking layers and layers and layers on top of each other, you're going to block off a lot of holes, and you're going to catch the errors. So why am I referencing this now is, well, the mock pipeline test sits in the middle of the stack of cheese. So you first have your unit test checking, is the code, you know, will this do what I think it would do? And then on the other side, you have your data tests, which will run on real data during the process, sort of at runtime when your pipeline is running. The mock pipeline tests sit in between, should run in your CI, and essentially they will run through a mocked version of your entire pipeline. It's almost an integration test. We call them mock pipeline tests at the, t at the time. That was the, the conceptually how we were thinking. So what does that look like? You generate some data um, back in 2017. So in this case, uh, Donald Duck was uh, apparently uh, wanting to transfer some money. And we had our pipeline, I referenced it, filter data. And essentially at the end, you want to say, okay, I just want to make sure that Donald Duck is no longer in there. It's similar to the data test, but it's dummy data, so you can be really specific. You can say, I, this account I know for a fact cannot be in there, rather than sort of at the higher aggregate level. Sometimes you can reuse the test, though. So this was back in 2017. Back in 2023, we can still use dbt for this. So you could, in our case, uh, I looked at integrating other tooling, uh, uh, so, so the unit testing packages that are available for dbt, but found actually using native, native dbt, at the time that would have got us, got us to the point that we got without dbt as well. So I'm interested in exploring more is what these other unit testing packages of dbt would bring on top, or perhaps even tools like Soda or Great Expectations could add into the mix as well. Um, again, you know, your data generation, that's something that you'd still need to do. Call your logic, run your logic, and then um, run your tests. It seems simple, but it saves you, especially if you run this in your CI, because it will catch things at commit time. You, ideally, if it's not too big, you could even run it in pre-commit. So still relevant, yes, uh, definitely still relevant. So it's a good thing that we're at layer seven, because we're running out of time. So layer seven was conceptually the most complicated one, especially given we had one Hadoop cluster, one Airflow environment. We were doing DTAP. Um, so the core idea of DTAP is you're going to create separate environments with separate sets of data, or at least subsets of your full data set, for a specific purpose. So in our case, we had four. We had development, test, acceptance, production, classic mapping of what people have been doing for years in, uh, let's say, the more DevOps application uh, uh, world. Um, in dev, we would do a random sample just to validate, does anything even work? In test, we had a hand-picked sample to make sure that the logic could actually link uh, certain uh, entities together. Acceptance was a carbon copy, so the entire data set was there. And production was production. So the quirky thing that we did in 2017 was we, we had this idea of we have one airflow, and then every 
environment was essentially another airflow pipeline or airflow DAG, and development, if it succeeded, would trigger test. Test, if it succeeded, would trigger acceptance. And then between acceptance and production, there was a manual approval, just to make sure, like, are you sure you want to roll this out to production? In 2033, I think, realistically, the idea of using one airflow is, uh, <laughs> well, let's say, living on the edge. I would always say split it out a bit um, and do this deployment between the DAGs with Git or some sort of CI CD flow, uh, depending on what you want. This also opens up the possibility of checking airflow upgrades. Uh, I remember sometimes at ING at the time, we had to do an airflow upgrade, and that just was fingers crossed and let's hope for the best because we don't quite know if everything will be okay. And then I remember a couple of cases where they had renamed the operators and then you have to go over all the DAGs to rename the operators. So that was, uh, was fun. So still relevant in 2023? Yes, but no would be what I would say. Uh, yes, in the sense that dedicated environments will help you. Yes, in the sense you need that separation to be able to operate freely, to check things out, to do things. No, in the sense, I'm not sure I would do four full environments. I think that's a bit much. Uh, and you need to balance it with how much it costs, how big your data is. Um, there's a quite a high price if you have seven billion transactions to do a full copy. Um, and I think you need to figure out, is that worth it? And do you need four environments? The thing is here as well, it's, it's not just a one-off copy, right, of production to acceptance. You need to keep that data set up to date, because otherwise there's not much point then your data on acceptance would be out of date and wouldn't contain the same quirks that production now has. So, we've gone through hell, we're still here. Um, and I just figured, okay, let's, what is still relevant? What are we, where are we at right now? So I think where we're at is that we can say the data integrity test, the ingestion split, data tests, alerting, and mock pipeline tests, those are relevant. I think those, yeah, you need some tweaking, there's some tooling that you might want to change. You know, the tooling has evolved, I'm glad to say. Um, but they're still okay. DTAP, yes, but I would change that quite substantially, more than I would change any of the, any of the, any of the others. Um, Git enforcing, yeah, I don't know. I wouldn't go there anymore. But if we take a step back, right, what are we actually talking about here? I mean, there's a quirky names or a memes, but underlying the names, underlying the memes, is actually some core ideas. So we're actually mapping, if you take a look at these tasks, you can probably mentally map them to some of the concepts on the right. You can say we're talking about code integrity and validity, right, with the uh, DAG integrity test. We're talking about pipeline structure. Again, DAG integrity test, but also the ingestion split, perhaps. Data quality, covered in your data test, your mock pipeline tests. Alerting, no need to add any more. And your separation of concerns. So I think those are really the core concepts that you still, six years on, are still valid. So I now have kids as well, and I just projected my kids saying, please, Dad, can we now leave hell? Are we finished? Are we nearly there yet? So I think working with real data can still be hard. Um, it's hard to know what to test. Um, it's hard to always catch all of the errors. I think it's just something you constantly need to work on because real data constantly surprises you. That was the case in 2017, and I think it's still the case now. In 2023, the tooling is so much better though. As I said, having DBT at the time would have saved us so much time, so I'm really happy to say that the stuff we did at the time with Spark Jobs and Spark SQL, that we wouldn't do that this way anymore. Um, so in that sense, tooling is much, much better. Um, looking forward, I think the tooling can still improve a bit, but what I'd really hope to see is that those three points there can get automated a bit more, that we don't need to all do this manual work of figuring out what to test, that we can get some sort of insight, some sort of suggestion, maybe maybe some profiling ideas, chat DBT, anyone? Something that can help us a bit to get started. So with that, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. Again, this is the GitHub link, so please check it out, and happy to take any questions.